left knee. Right. That was my left one that popped when I stepped out of it. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if it's your left knee, that's patrol car knee from all those years of stepping in and out of the car on the left leg, right? Well, I, I think my right one is from when my left leg wouldn't work and uh, I overused it. Yep. Been there. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's get. Okay, that's on. Mobile sounds on. I'm going to turn this one off. Turn it off. Get that down out of my way. Well, we had quite a week. You wonder why sometimes Pastor doesn't seem to get everything done. Um, we made three separate trips to St. Charles this week. Uh, four different people. One to transport somebody there who walked his head and had to get stitches. And uh, somebody from outside the church, but a friend of mine, and um, he needed a ride. So we spent seven hours in the ER so he could get A, rehydrated, and B, get three stitches up on the side of his head. It's like, that's a long time for that. It's like, I could have done that with, you know, some Gatorade and <laughs> super glue and been done. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I can do some I can do some first aid as long as it's not somebody else. I don't like doing it myself. I pass out. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So yeah. We had a nice men's breakfast yesterday. Some of you were there, some of you were not. Okay, men. And uh, so I went home and others went home with lots of leftovers, but we had a good uh, fellowship time and a little study time and excellent food. So on the third Saturday of next month, make sure it's on your calendar, men's breakfast. Hey, we might do something different. I don't know. It might be time for French toast or something. So I had, see, I had gourmet French toast a few weeks ago at this law enforcement retreat, and I'm going to see if I can, one of these days, duplicate that. So we'll see. I mean, it was like, what? Off the chart. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let's get into the message. All right. So I was sitting there thinking of this yesterday as I was finishing up my, my study, and uh, and right now, I would say the political climate in not just our country, but I would, we'll call it at least the Western world, is full of conspiracy theories. Many of which, not all, but many of which are certainly based in truth or an actual fact, right? And um, I'm sure many of us, myself included, have our favorites, right? Like when I uh, watched... You know, the, uh, the aftermath of the first assassination attempt against uh, former President Trump, uh, I immediately started thinking of conspiracy theories. And, and they could be true, right? Well, you know, you maybe, maybe portions of our government are complicit in this whole thing, you know, like, oh, that kind of stuff. And there's other things out there, too. And it would be very easy for me to focus solely upon those things and about all the bad things that are or could be happening in this world, right? Okay? Um, and that's not where my, at least for me, that's not where my focus needs to be. You know, there's a conspiracy in the Bible, and it's not a theory, it's fact. There's well, several conspiracies in the Bible, but there's certainly one in Matthew chapter 26. Okay? So I want you to turn your Bibles there. And this conspiracy that I'm talking about was a conspiracy to kill Jesus. A conspiracy to kill Jesus because people actually conspired, right, to kill him. That's what conspiracy means. What, what happens when we conspire to do something? We work together to make it happen, right? That's a conspiracy. It's one thing if one, you know, lone gunman all by himself with no help goes out and does something. It's another if people plan to make that happen. Right? I mean... You know, we can think of, you know, the assassination of... How many, how many conspiracy theories are there on the assassination of John F. Kennedy Jr.? There's a lot. There's been movies made about, you know. Some of them are pretty good movies, right? Um, but, you know, books written about it. And, you know, people making money on those conspiracies. And the same thing will happen with, you know, this most current... You know, the most current two attempts. So it's all going to happen, right? But here's a real conspiracy. This one is fact. This one we know for sure. Matthew wrote it down for us, as did uh, some of the other gospel writers. They wrote down little bits and pieces of it, okay? Uh, Mark being one of them. But we're going to concentrate on Matthew uh, chapter 26, the first, I don't know, 13 verses or so of it. So this real conspiracy to kill Jesus 
has its roots clear back in, believe it or not, in Old Testament law and prophecy. What? That's right. Not that Old Testament law and prophecy was a conspiracy, but the sacrifices instituted in the Old Testament in the Mosaic law were all designed to paint the big giant neon arrow to the New Testament, we call it, right? To Jesus. And so the sacrifice of the, of the animals, you know, the sheep and the goats and the bulls and all that kind of stuff was really to point towards the sacrifice of the Son of God. And the high priest, whoever the high priest was, it was their job. They had, a lot of, they had lots of functions, right? But one of their jobs was to make sure that the Passover festival was celebrated. And also, the high priest's job was to conduct the sacrifices on what's known as the Day of Atonement, where the nation, where the priest would atone for his sins with the sacrifice of an animal, and the nation would atone for its sins with the sacrifice of an animal, plus there was the whole scapegoat thing where the priest would, you know, pray the sins of the nation over the, over the goat, and they'd send it off into the wilderness to try to survive on its own. That's, that's, that's where the term scapegoat comes from, by the way. Okay? That was the high priest's job. Therefore, the high priest had to sacrifice Jesus. What? That's right. That's the high priest's job, was to sacrifice the Lamb. It says, we call Jesus the Lamb of God. He calls himself that, right? The high priest had to do it. He didn't really have a choice. That's how God ordained it. That's how God planned it out. The high priest had to sacrifice Jesus, who is Jesus, who is the ultimate Passover and atonement lamb of sacrifice. So clear back into the Exodus, where God tells Moses, tell your people to bring a lamb into the house to feed it for a few days. The kids will probably give it a name, right? And then to kill that lamb, and to take some of the blood of that lamb and to paint it over the, you know, the lintel and the doorpost of the house, and then to cook it and to eat it, and to be prepared to flee the country. That's what Passover is about, okay? Well, that's what it was originally about. But it's really, originally, it's actually about painting the way to Jesus as the sacrifice, right? So that the blood of Jesus given on the cross, like the blood of the lamb painted on the doorpost of the house, would bring safety and salvation to those in the house. Because what happened in Egypt was, as the angel of death passed over the land of Egypt, any house that did not have the blood over the doorpost and the lintel, the angel of death would kill the firstborn in that house, whether it was human or animal. Hence, a lot of Egyptians died. That was the blood of salvation in Exodus. And Jesus, of course, is the complete fulfillment of that. Same with the Day of Atonement, lambs of sacrifice. So there's this, what seems to be a conspiracy, and it is a conspiracy, but it has roots that come from God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26, start in verse 1. Now it came to pass... When Jesus had finished all these sayings, all these sayings of chapter 25, remember the parables? As he's hammering the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests, right? Hammering them over and over and over again as he stands in the temple grounds teaching the people. Teaching them about really the end times, right? Well, that made, that made these guys mad. Okay? They're spitting nails. They've been trying to figure out a way to get rid of them. So it says, now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, that's back to chapter 25 and previously, that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover. So we're two days from the Passover when Jesus says this, the middle of the week. And the Son of Man, that's Jesus himself, will be delivered up to be crucified. He can't say it any plainer than that. He knows it's coming. It's been planned that way. 
that he will die as that final Passover lamb. You know that after two days is the Passover, the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So Jesus is saying this to his disciples, and at the same time, or roughly the same time during that same week, let's see what happens in verse 3. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. There's your conspiracy. They conspire together to kill Jesus. They think they're doing this on their own, but this is all part of God's plan. But let's look at part of their plan. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. They planned to kill Jesus after the Passover, or maybe way before, but they were running out of time, right? Their plan was just to kill Jesus after the Passover, because here's what happens in Jerusalem at the time. During the, during the week or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's the same time period, okay? People come from all over the world where Jews are to go to the Passover week. So Jerusalem is filled with people from all over, certainly all over the Roman Empire, right? And they don't want to do it there and there because they don't want to riot. We know what riots are. Well, not so much here in the Pine. I haven't really seen a riot here, right? But we know what riots are about in Oregon, in the United States, right? Or what they can be like. They did not want a riot among the people because if there's a riot, the Roman army's going to come down and they ain't going to hold back. Right? The Roman army will come in and crush said riot. So they don't want a riot among them. They want to do this sneaky, right? It says they, they plotted to take Jesus in New King James, by trickery and kill him. They want to cheat. Much like the conspiracies of today. Not during the feast. That was their plan. God's plan was that Jesus would be crucified during the Passover week at the time just prior to Everybody's sitting down to eat the Passover meal. Right? Friday night. That's why Jesus and his disciples have their last supper, if you want to call it that, their Passover meal, the night before. Because he knows, right? He is that final lamb of sacrifice. See, the priests, the high priest and, and his sub-high priest, if we want to call him that, they wanted to kill Jesus without making him a martyr. Right? I mean, what happens when, you know, anywhere in the world, some, you know, famous person that has a following, whoever that might be, is, is killed by the opposition? What do we call that person? What do, what do we make him into? Make him into a martyr. Oh, you know. So, the priest didn't want Jesus to be a martyr. Because they thought, you know, their thought would be, well, boy, if we kill them during this week, you know, all these people that are here are going to be mad at us, and they're coming for us. And that's what happens when you make somebody into a martyr. You really stir up opposition, don't you? So they wanted to kill Jesus without making him a martyr, yet God foreordained his death for this time. Caiaphas could not prevent it, even if he wanted to. Not that he tried. But even if he, want, if he truly wanted to prevent the death of Jesus, even if he just said, hey, whoa, we're not doing this now, everybody go home, right? He could not have prevented it. It was bound to happen. Because you see, the high priest's job was to see to those sacrifices. And Jesus being that ultimate Lamb of God, the final Lamb of God, the sacrifice for the Passover, and the sacrifice for the Day of Atonement, Caiaphas could not stop it. God hardened his heart, I believe, just like he hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would see to it. At the same time as this conspiracy is going on, there's something else happening. We're going to read that in just a minute. 
the same time as the conspiracy during this week, Mary, the sister, there's a lot of Marys in the New Testament if you haven't figured that out. Okay? I mean, you know, some names are really popular. You know, there's, well, there's two Dons in the room right now for sure, right? Any more Dons, right? John, we talked about this men's breakfast yesterday. There used to be three Dons, and now, you know, one's gone. Okay. Two Dons plus another guy that's got a dad whose name is Donald, right? So there's two Dons in here. Um, does anybody else in here got the same name? My grandfather. My dad. You have the same name as your grandfather's name was Dan? I don't, but my grandfather's oh. name. Okay, all right. So it's not uncommon, right? I mean, I, when I was a kid in school, in my school, in my class of, well, there's, our class was split into half. You had, you know, first grade was 1A and 1B. Half were on one side of the hall, the other half were on the other. If you combine the two, you had 60 kids roughly, and there was like three mics in my, in my class. I think we graduated a class of 60 or something like that with three mics. All right? Mike was really popular, apparently, around 1966. When, when my class was born. All right? So it's not unusual to have multiple names. So Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. We see that in John chapter 12. We're not going to go there, but this cross-references to John 12. What she does is she anoints Jesus during this week, during the conspiracy. She anoints Jesus for burial while he still lived. Now that's a little unusual, isn't it? I want you to imagine, I'm not going to name our nice funeral home down the street, because there are actually very nice people that work there, because, you know, I don't want to get on YouTube and go, oh, these people are crazy, right? Imagine that a representative from the funeral home down the street comes to your house while you're alive and says, I see you've got this, you know, you've got this burial plan or this, you know, cremation plan, whatever it is. How about we embalm you now? <laughs> Ahead of time. Well, you know, it might make your skin look a little less wrinkly. I don't know. <laughs> That's a little weird, isn't it? Yeah. That you would be embalmed before your body has died. And yet, what Mary does is she anoints himself with a, with a perfumed oil, which is kind of how they would do it. You know, they'd use spices and all that kind of stuff. But ahead of time, she anoints him. Not just because he's king, but because he's going to die. Somehow she knew. I think perhaps because she paid more attention to what to Jesus' words than most of the other people in the New Testament. Uh -huh. Well, if you remember, if you go back to Mary and Martha, right? In a previous scene at their house in Bethany, Martha's in the kitchen cooking. Mary's out sitting at the feet of Jesus, hanging on every word that he says. And Martha gets mad, right? It's the same Mary and Martha here. Okay? I think perhaps she knew, because she paid attention. So, continuing in Matthew chapter 26. So you got the, you got the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, and the high priest are conspiring to kill Jesus. They're hoping they can do it after the Passover. Okay? But Jesus, verse 6, was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. A woman came to him, that would be Mary, that's what John, John gives us the name. Matthew leaves her anonymous, John gives us the name. Might have to do with the timing of the writing, I don't know. Okay? And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, so he's not at Mary's house, he's at Simon's house. A different Simon than the other Simons that we know of. A woman came to him having an alabaster, alabaster flask. Alabaster looks like marble. Okay? Stone. An alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. And John gives us another detail. She also poured it on his feet. Okay? So she really anoints his body as best she can. From head to toe. She poured it on his head, and as John says, also on his feet, as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but, you, but me you do not have always. 
For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. As surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Mary knew somehow. She knew something was coming. Jesus has been telling them, he's fixing to get arrested. He's going to be crucified. I mean, he's flat told him he's going to be crucified. Okay? Apparently, nobody else has really caught on to this. But Mary did. Mary was preparing him for his burial. Well, this turns out to be the final straw for Judas Iscariot. That's, that's who the true indignant one is. Let's just go over to John chapter 12. We'll look at a couple of other verses there. It gives a little more context to this story. I'll start in verse 1. Then six days before the Passover. So it's during that week, right? Probably like Tuesday. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Remember, that was just prior to the triumphal entry, so that's like a week prior, right? There they made him supper, and Martha served, as she always does. Good for her. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary... We know. Took a pound of very costly oil of spike guard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples. So now we're getting back into the, the you know, you could call it the murder conspiracy, right? But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, not Simon the leper, right? Probably. Okay. One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. He was the 12 disciples and Jesus' treasurer. Okay? He used to dip, tap the till, so to speak. And Jesus said, let her alone, she has kept this day, this for the day of my burial, etc. So this is the final straw for Judas Iscariot. This is not the first time that I think Jesus has maybe put him in his place, especially when it comes to money. He's saying, she's doing this for my burial, or Jesus saying that, and Judas is saying, well, she could sell it, right? Make some money. And we could do more ministry that way. We could further the ministry of the church. Well, they didn't call it the church then, did they? But you see, we could we get in danger of doing that here too, right? Like if somebody, you know, let's say uh, somebody buys something from the church that is very nice, Right? Very, maybe very beautiful, but perhaps not absolutely necessary. There is a temptation, certainly for me, right, to go, well, we didn't need that. You could have put that money in the plate and we could have put it towards something really important. And no, I don't have the till. I keep my, I don't even know who writes a check, okay? That's why I have other people can't put it. I don't, don't want to know, right? But this is the final straw for Judas. And if we go back into Matthew chapter 26, we're going to see what Judas does. And verse 14 says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? See, they were going to wait. They were already conspiring to kill Jesus, and along comes Judas. Well, do you not think that maybe God is using this situation with Judas and his final straw to complete the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus when God wants it to happen? 
Because the priest wanted it to happen like the next week or the week after when everybody had gone home, you know, back to Libya and Egypt and, you know, Eastern Europe and Central Europe, wherever else they were living. God uses this situation to move the chief priests. So Judas goes to them and says, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Now I would think, since they really want to kill Jesus, he'd be worth a lot more than what they offer. But you know, we see this in our society when some crazy person tries to hire a hitman to kill somebody else. It's like they always offer something stupid like $2,000. Really? That's barely a rent payment in one of the trailers down the street. I mean, if you really want somebody dead, you better be willing to pony up a lot of money. That's at least my thinking anyway. It's my cop brain going, really? That's all you're going and, 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 and you actually believe that the person that says that, yes, they'll do it for $2,000 isn't like an FBI agent or something? Right? Posing as a hitman? Because that happens, right? Well, I didn't know I was hiring a cop. Well, you know, when you post on Facebook, looking for hitman must be reasonably priced. <laughs> Who are you going to get? Right? You're not going to get a real hitman. Right? You're going to get somebody posing anyone something. They can come arrest you later. So, he asked, and it was like, okay, Judas, never ask the question that way. What are you willing to pay? You should have asked it like, you give me so much and I'll deliver him to you. But he didn't do that, right? Not a very good businessman, really. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. There is, you know, almost the culmination of this conspiracy. They were going to wait. Let's wait. But now all of a sudden, we got this guy, and they knew, they had to know, he's from the inner circle. Every time they see Jesus and the disciples together, Judas Iscariot is in the midst of him carrying the money box. So they cheap out. And I offer him 30 pieces of silver. But that's even biblical too. Because what he does is Judas agrees to the price foretold back in Zechariah. So let's just have a little fun here. And let's go back into the Old Testament and look up Zechariah, which I should have put a post-it note in my Bible because it's kind of small. There it is. It's towards the end of the Old Testament if you're looking for it. To Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah is a prophet in Israel during the time of the dividing of the kingdom and the, and the, and the captivity of Israel and Judah. Right in the middle of chapter 12, there's this little thing. It's like, wasn't that interesting? We'll start in verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. So this is a prophecy about Israel, the Jews, right? Seeing the resurrected Jesus. This hasn't happened yet, folks. Okay? This is a prophecy about future Israel, yet to be. They will look on me whom they pierce. Verse 10. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, and the mourning at Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, etc., etc. And I wrote down the wrong Zechariah thing. Okay, that was done. I fat fingered my computer keyboard. Somewhere in Zechariah, okay? I'll find it later. Somewhere in Zechariah, 
in these prophecies of Israel is the prophecy of they paid 30 pieces of silver for my life. I'll find it later or tell you next week because uh, I'll be lost looking for it today. Okay? Sorry about that. Oops. That's what happens when you're in a hurry. The clear back in Zechariah. Four or five hundred years, this five hundred years, maybe six hundred years before the birth of Jesus. The price for Jesus was already agreed upon. Hmm. So even though there's this conspiracy amongst the high priest and the chief priests and Judas Iscariot, they end up fulfilling prophecy with, really without their knowledge. People who are supposed to know the Bible are fulfilling Old Testament prophecy as they did it without realizing that they did it. So they're a conspiracy, even though they thought it up, was really ordained by God. For in order for Jesus to be killed, in order for Jesus to be considered as the Lamb of God, as the sacrifice of or the you know sacrifice of atonement and the sacrifice for the Passover, we're going to call him the Passover Lamb, right? They had to accomplish it because that was their office and their position. They had to do it. What seems to be a human conspiracy is actually orchestrated by God to complete His plan. Now let's put that into today's context. The things that are happening. I know we all desire, as do I, to live in a Christian nation. Is there really such a thing? There's Christians in our nation. Always has been. Right? There's also Christians in Iran, so there you go. There's Christians in China. They're not Christian nations. We live in what, what many of us would call a post-Christian nation. Of course, I think back to you know, you know, my my teenage years and my young adulthood, a lot of people would have said, including high school classmates of mine, and they just had their 40th reunion yesterday. I skipped it. It's like I went to the 30th, I was born, so I didn't go to the 40th. Okay? A lot of them would have said, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. Based on what? Well, I was born in the United States. I'm a good person. You know, I was baptized as, a, as an infant or something. Okay, you got your head wet. <laughs> hmm. And you don't remember it anyway. So, where's your change of heart? We don't live in a Christian nation. Yeah, it was certainly founded on some Christian principles. We're not the only one. So I, but I would like at least, can we at least go back to the 80s? Seriously. I would love for our nation to at least be back, you know, maybe not necessarily, oh, well, maybe technology-wise, that'd be okay. You know, phones with cords, be okay. You know, no internet, no email, no smartphone, that'd be all right. Although, I use my smartphone all the time, especially for navigation, I love being able to use Google Maps on my phone so I can figure out where I'm going to bend or, you know, other places. But being a child, having grown up, you know, as a teenager and a young adult in the 80s, I think that's the, that was the best decade ever. Certainly had the best rock music. So, not necessarily the best rock musician hairstyles and outfits, but the music, a lot of it was pretty good, I thought. Still do. Okay? I know some of you old folks are like, oh, that's terrible. I want to go back to the music of the 40s. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, I, love, I would love to go back those days, but it's not going to happen. There's never going to be another President Ronald Reagan if he was your favorite. If he's not your favorite, then you'll be thankful, right? There'll never, never be another one like him. There'll never be another one like Donald Trump. Just won't, right? Each one is an individual. But I would love to go back to those days, but what is it that I'm really looking forward to? I'm not looking forward to going back to the old days. 
I'm looking forward to the rapture. And depending on where you are in the tribulation time scale, okay, I'm not just looking forward to the rapture. I'm looking forward to the second coming of Christ where the remnant of Israel says, Jesus is Messiah. He is King. And He rights the wrongs of this world. I'm looking forward to that. And in order for those days to come, there's going to be a whole lot of conspiracies in between time. And a whole lot of things going on that, you know, we can look at and go, this is really bad. Yes, it is. If we're thinking temporarily. If we're thinking of our own comfort. So that's where I get, you know, like, well, I want the freedom to do this. And, you know, I want the freedom to say what I want. Because I got the Bill of Rights. Do you really? Seems like it's that foundation is becoming weaker. And that's not what's nearly as important as Jesus coming to get me and you. Perhaps, I'll finish with this. Perhaps, I think it's highly likely, okay, that God allows the conspiracies we see unfolding today. To bring Israel. Because the end times is about not about me. It's not about my comfort here in, in, in the, well, I would say probably the greatest country, country in the world as far as freedom, the ability to move about, right? We at least at one time had the ability to say what we want, right? Without fear of too much repercussion. The ability to travel armed, legally, in some places. It's not about that, right? I think that God allows the conspiracies we see unfolding today to bring Israel, it's about them, to an eventual point of national repentance and worship of Jesus. <clears throat> right now, Israel as a nation is doing what it wants to do. I don't blame them for going to war against their neighbors to the west, the north, and somewhat to the east. But Israel is missing something. They're missing Jesus. And they're not going to come to Jesus until Israel is backed into a corner. With the world against them. I think God is orchestrating these things. Allowing things to happen to fulfill His plan. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about them. Because they are God's chosen people and they are the ones who rejected His Son. They've paid a price for that for 2,000 years. And then God brought the remnants, what's left of them, back together as a nation. I am thankful that it was the United States that was the first nation to recognize Israel as a country within the United Nations. I'm not thankful for the UN. I always wish they would go away. Okay? They're a part of the problem. But that's out of my control, isn't it? But it's all about bringing Israel to their knees to worship Jesus. So all these things, the weakened, the moral weakening of really Western culture. We can go, we can just take, you know, Europe West, Canada, United, you know, North America, Canada, United States. I'm not going to pick on, on what we may call the godless countries. I'm going to pick on our country. We are weak morally as a nation. We have been for quite some time. It's just been building and building and building and now it's like got a big head of steam. Right? Like Casey Jones is driving this locomotive. <laughs> but that's all part of God's plan. To bring Israel to its knees to a point of national repentance. And in order for that to happen, the world's got to get crazier. So I want you to focus on God's Word. I want you to focus on 
why these things are happening. I want you to praise God even in the midst of, especially in our, in our nation, people just being nutty. Right? People rejecting God, rejecting His Word, rejecting His design for them, rejecting His creation. At some point, it's all got to happen. Yeah, we'd like to, for it to not happen in our lifetime. Let that happen to somebody else. But maybe it's our turn. God allows things that are bad to bring about things that are good. He allowed the chief priests the high priest, the religious leaders. He allowed them to begin to develop this conspiracy. He allowed, he, I think he hardened Judas Iscariot's heart, just like he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Allowed Satan to influence Judas to sell him out. To say, whatever you give me, I'll bring him to you. Just like he's allowing the events of today for his eternal purpose. That's where our focus needs to be. Let's pray. <clears throat> While we're about to sing the hymn, Where He Leads Me, I will follow. And he may be leading us, you may be leading us, <clears throat> some places maybe we don't want to go. You said that to Peter. Jesus says, when you are old, others will lead you where you do not want to go. Maybe that's where we're at. But that's okay. Because we know you're coming back for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.